And next speaker. Uh, so the next speaker told me this story that he was about to share several months ago when he moved into my apartment. Uh, so I'm really excited to have him on stage tonight to share it with all of you. Uh, please welcome for his first Odd Salon talk, Scott Valentine, and the forgotten history of East Berlin's gay bars. Let's see if I can do this. Um, okay. When I was a younger artist, I kept hearing these whispers about Berlin. I wanted to see it for myself. So, to even my surprise, I secured a research fellowship with the Humboldt University. My research topic being vague, historic gay communities in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine colliding political history, art history, film, and anthropology to produce counter narratives for the LGBT community. Woo. Um, off the plane with only two distant friends and my new burner phone, I did what any other self-respecting 20-year-old gay man does in the new city. I found a new gay bar. <laughs> After a few drinks, some forgettable conversations, I suddenly found myself focused on a previous question, focusing closer onto that previous question. Where could gay culture and activism exist during Berlin's divorce? Again, at a gay bar, where everyone knows your name. <clears throat> So gay bars have always been a community watering hole to hold court, organize, and disrupt history. Just think of the Stonewall Riot. Only, recent, only recently have academics turned their attention to investigating these types of subcultures in East Berlin. For me, because of the DDR's brief famine, cultural lag, governmental censorship, and about 50,000 unsolved cases of missing persons, I felt East Berlin needed to work on its historical branding. So countless hours spent in archives, interviews with East Berlin gay baby boomers, and several sleepless nights doing field research in nightclubs <laughs> supplied me with enough information on East gay bars while also learning my personal limits to party culture. <laughs> <laughs> These desperate parts, piece, of, piece by piece, came together with my own urban conspiracy theory. So here goes nothing. So the setup, we need some history. Homosexual acts were banned under the Prussian Empire in 1794, under a legal amendment, paragraph 143, which stated, quote, sexual acts among men is deemed immoral and punishable by the state. In the 1860s, a community of scholars, writers, and politicians began advocating for its removal. Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, a writer who outed himself publicly because of his outrage against such law, is considered to be the grandfather of modern gay rights movement. So, He's not an asshole. <clears throat> Another redeemable white guy was Carl Maria Kernberny, which I understand his name is super faggy, but he's not. A journalist and an LGBT ally who took up the cause after losing a close friend himself for being outed. Kenberry started a very lengthy campaign arguing that the Prussian sodomy law violated the rights of man advancing the classical liberal argument that consensual, consensual sexual acts in private should not be subject to criminal law. He also put forward the radical biological view, science, um, that homosexuality was inborn and unchangeable, contradicting the dominant view of the time that men committed sodomy out of mere wickedness. Gay men, he said, were not by nature effeminate, and he pointed out that many of the great heroes of history were gay. For example, Hadrian the Great, Plato, Pope Julius II for his fabulous, fabulous dresses, and Adam Rippon. So when Germany got back together for the third, possibly fourth time, it's hard to keep track in the 1890s, the leader, August Babel, giant asshole, threw all his support behind a new heinous amendment, paragraph 175, doubling down on anti-sodomy laws. But in 1929, or in 1829, another committee decided to outright repeal it. Sorry, it is 1929. Time, you know, whatever. Uh, another committee decided to outright repeal it, and they actually won. This is also the Myanmar Republic, so Cabaret, for example. However, victory was short, sweet, and never celebrated as Surprise, the Nazi party prevented the implementation of such a repeal. Uh, Assholes. So in 1935, 
<laughs> yeah, what, um, what rhymes with Waldo? I'll let you do that. Uh, so in 1935, the Nazis broadened this law to, act, to any lewd act whatsoever, including no physical contact between men, also banning masturbation next to each other. I actually have a serious question for straight men in the audience. Is this a theme? Like, really, I'm an executive platinum gay man here. Come find me afterward. Let's talk, not masturbate next to each other. I really want to know. Okay. So under this new law, convic convictions multiplied by a factor of 10, often through raids of secret gay bars. By war's end, approximately 100,000 homosexual men were forced into concentration camps, identified by pink triangles. Less than 50% survived. So if you didn't know this already, the pink triangle is actually honoring these men and, and actually just the LGBT community that were put in concentration camps. So to clarify a little about history too, Paragraph 175 was a law that affected mostly gay men and transgender individuals. While there was an attempt to include lesbians, evidence of such lewd acts between women were difficult to prove. <laughs> if anything, I wonder if this was not included because of that hetero male gaze thing that fantasizes about two girls all up on each other, which is why I chose Jill Solibule. Anyway, um, so it's also incredibly interesting to point out that until this point in time, the idea of homosexuality being natural has actually been debated in Germany for 150 years. That's fucking awesome. So anyway, back to the story. In the 1950s, East Germany abolished the Nazi amendments as well as temporarily halting any new arrests. The wall went up in 1961, dividing the city. In 1968, the East made its stance more lenient and repealed it fully. And fun fact, the West didn't do it until 1994. What the fuck? <laughs> Come on, people. So through paragraph 175, it was not enforced in East Berlin. The secret police continued to arrest gay men and gender nonconforming citizens, mostly due to their political organi organizing, but especially for breaking of curfews and laws associated to setting up illegal bars and clubs. The plot thickens. <clears throat> hey, Waldo. So, yep. so why did the East go limp-wristed on such a harsh punishment? The social and cultural theorist Klaus Thielwelt's two-volume book that I highly recommend is called Male Fantasies. And he discusses the perplexing notion as the rise of fascism paralleled BDSM subcultures in Germany specifically. As a brief overview of his 800 pages spread between these two volumes, under fascism, gendered roles were seen as agents to the state, not as a site where human desire and pleasure could be explored. Therefore, the act of men helping each other ejaculate via flogging, sodomy, and other acts of sadomasochism release were viewed primarily as necessary maintenance processes. <laughs> Fucking love history. Read the footnotes. <laughs> anyway, so historians Robert Beachy's essay, The German Investigation of Homosexuality, argues that, human, or that homosexual rights began in Germany under Eastern fascism, but failed to mention if, why, or how Westerners were present in these conversations. It was in reading Ingrid Sharp's The Sexual Unification of Germany that quickly turned my conspiracy into factual possibility. Running with uh, social science, close, tangential, I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> so running with this new tip, I spent two weeks in the DDR's central archives laboring over several Stasi reports, which is kind of fucking awesome. Some came completely with notes left un with, by unknown spies in their margins. The, uh, I kind of felt like I was in the lives of others Anyway, with the surveillance state and massive overload, many spies noted that West Berliners were attending these secret gay bars, despite the risk Westerners were finding safe passage east to help organize for civil rights. How did Westerners find out about these bars? In 1968, a little gay publication that could fit in your dungarees back pocket began <laughs> circulating. 
Berlin Report for Freund, or Berlin for Friends. Hmm, how cute. Um, an Eastern section ended the booklet, and over the years, it grew from just a handful of listings to about half the book. What made this more intriguing and participatory, participatory as a researcher was discovering these booklets did not accurately print addresses for Eastern bars. So it was a scavenger hunt. For example, the description of a bar named Kinos was located near the U-Bahn behind a laundromat owned by a guy named Carl. I'm not making this up. <laughs> so I also want to point out there's also in the listing an extensive list of bathrooms so you could find your man for man for the moment. So for completion of my time in Berlin, I approached it more as an artist, creating several cryptic maps, conceptualizing what finding these bars might have felt like. I formally photographed old, old addresses uh, to anthropomorphically represent these spaces that no longer existed. Through the passing of time to coexist on these images, I then chose to use a narrative tool by overlaying embroidery and pink uh, spray paint, marring the surfaces with a ghostly map and marks of modern day Berlin, constantly under construction. So the 21 pink dots signify the bars and sites, uh, that, the men that were mentioned in Stasi reports I came across. While there is substantial evidence within the, the Stasi reports, interior photographs of such bars do not exist. I have my hopes out that maybe one day they'll turn up like buried treasure. So, to con and this is another reason why sometimes I feel like going out is like conjuring up the ghosts of East Berlin in nightlife, that you kind of feel like there's this idea of temporality. So, how did the Westerners get to these late bars? For this, there are a few speculative possibilities. Good old fashioned bribery. <laughs> the Berlin Wall was not an impenetrable boundary. There were areas of safe passage. Westerners could generally visit East Germany with a day visa. If you're a Westerner applauding a queer resistance, couldn't you just pay the guy off? Come on. Uh, the second, film history as anthropological tool. So in looking and viewing several films created in and about East Berlin, one can stitch together a broader picture of how illegal film shoots could crisscross between the East and the West. One film in particular coming out shows its lead character uh, driving along a main road that's in West Berlin. A 2009 documentary, Rabbits a la Berlin, tells a story of hundreds of rabbits living between the walls known as the dead zone because it was void of life. Though it is just a film and is uncertain how we got there, a few other films show Westerners getting visas, but it's very dicey as to understand how this occurred during this time period. So the third and my favorite, through interviews with East Berliners, many alluded to areas where the Berlin Wall had incomplete parts that were not heavily guarded. So too afraid to try and cross themselves, <laughs> this area in question is what is now Ma Mauer Park and extends north into a neighborhood called Vetting. There were bombed out buildings. So now if I were alive then, this sounds like a plausible notion based on club culture that large abandoned areas with little supervision or people to complain about noise, <laughs> that sounds perfect. Like that's where I'm gonna be. So secondarily, if you look at the clustering of bars in a map, a significant amount are in the region of interest. Could this also be the missing key to the film Rabbits a la Berlin where they were trapped but knew of such safe passage to the outside world? With the wall gone and the LGBT community as well, mostly in, in East Berlin, it's hard to corroborate these stories of why who, and who were in attendance to these venues. I tend to gravitate towards this last possibility as it relates to other gay practices of trespassing, cruising in parks and bathrooms during an era of anti-sodomy laws. They support a grander myth here of resilience. How romantic to imagine under the cloak of night, gay bodies scurrying between the wall to safe houses where queer Congress from both sides could lay the groundwork for a future resistance for LGBT and international liberation. Or maybe just the beer was cheaper, I don't know. <laughs> so the queer scholar Jose Esteban Munoz, when he discusses the idea of gay bars, clubs, and sites of ecstatic activities, mentions, quote, queer spaces are sites of ephemeral topographies and activities between the imagined and the physical. It is in our acceptance of these two realms that are in constant negotiation with one another, where society and mass continues to acknowledge their slippages without prejudice, allowing them to harmoniously exist in tandem. <laughs> to conclude, <laughs> on November 9th, 1989, 
David Hasselhoff gave us a performance of his lifetime. <laughs> Precariously perched in a cherry picker overlooking the Berlin Wall, complete with 350 lights sewn into a leather jacket eight years before Burning Man was a thing, <laughs> and a piano key scarf around his neck to compete with outfit. Champagne corks flew and the world celebrated as one of the last remaining horcruxes of the Cold War. Yeah. Putin, you're next. <laughs> Came down. While he serenaded the crowd to his hit Freedom, I've never heard of this, but anyway. Um, fireworks light up the sky while a lone bulldozer symbolically dismantled a single portion of the wall. While the world celebrated, still in the DDR, another significant moment was taking place that same night. The closing out film for the Kino International Film Festival was coming out. Hailed as the first and only feature film about gay life in East Berlin, produced by the East German State Film Studio, it is a time capsule of the queer scene. The film dealt in factual terms with the lead character, Philip, a high school teacher who could no longer suppress his desire and accepts himself as gay. While we know the history all too well, the idea of a wall is always a flawed human experiment rooted in utopian idealism to protect. Gay bars everywhere will continue to be resilient, surviving countless more wars and rebirthing itself again and again. Despite these setbacks, gay bars are a Shangri-La for the creative class, for the freaks, for those exploring their mind, body, and soul. The East Berlin scene is another case study showcasing how the LGBT community continues to rise above despite millennia of mistreatment. They also teach us similar lessons that Thor's Ragnarok taught us. <laughs> it isn't the place, but the people. So I want to raise a glass, and I want to toast all those queer people throughout history who stood up trespassed, dance to Miss Ross, and allow us all to feel so fucking free. We are the wild, we are ungovernable. Thank you, Scott.